<clears throat> Thanks for tuning in to the Pace of Performance podcast. So this evening, I am delighted to welcome five years on for a part two, Patrick Ward. So welcome to the podcast for a part two, mate. Thanks a lot. It's uh, evening for you, afternoon for me. So I'm, I'm working on my uh, afternoon coffee. Absolutely. We're ready to go. That's a big coffee. That is a big coffee. That's an American sized coffee, isn't it? <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, yeah, they don't have this. I feel like in the UK, they're the coffees are much smaller. I, We're behind. I, on I, that I guess front. it's always espresso. It's always espresso, isn't it? Yeah, probably maybe mm-hmm. the European influence of the small Polish yeah. coffee. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, five years on, still the Seahawks, which is fantastic, of course. Maybe little yep, certain really. things have changed with the with the role itself. Do you want to give us a? If it hasn't. Give yeah. us a bit of an update on what's what's been going on the last five years. Uh, yeah, when did I start? I'm probably seven years in now. Uh, and I started uh, doing sports science analytics. That was my original hire, was a, a sports science analytic. And then after about three years, transitioned into more of a, a research and development role. So um, not just looking at, I guess, however you want to define it, sports science things. Um, we also look at, you know, across all the football operations. So, you know, um, player valuation, trades, uh, uh, draft analysis. Um, we do, we do a, an a opponent advance, like a scouting advance for our coaching staff. So um, the stats for the upcoming team, probabilities, and all those kinds of things. So it's more, uh, I guess you would say, all-encompassing. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So- in terms of the department, is it a department of a couple now? How has that been built out? There's there's three of us. Right. So there's myself and uh, there's another guy, Josh, uh, who is a, a proper data engineer and uh, and does data analysis as well. So he and I do a lot of that stuff. And then uh, we also have Brian, who does um, data analysis, but he's almost exclusively on the coaching side. So everything that um, the head coach needs and that kind of stuff. Uh, and he's, he's good. Um, he knows a lot about analysis, but he was also a former division three quarterback and he was a former offensive coordinator in uh, division three football. So he knows a ton about the game and about how plays are called and about how it works. So, um, he kind of helps to serve as a translator sometimes for, um, uh, for, for Josh and myself, who I guess, would be considered outsiders from the the traditional, you know, we didn't come up through the game type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in that transition from what may be defined as traditional sports science, maybe in your first couple of years at the Seahawks into this role that you're in now. Was that something that you sold to them of how much of of the impact you could have on the wider organization or something that they saw the value and then brought you in? Well, it was a little of both, I think. Um, You know, initially, after like my first year with the team, we get into kind of the draft season and all the scouts are there doing draft meetings. And um, I was, uh, it's a topic that fascinated me and something I had looked at with different sports. So I I just asked our GM casually one day, like, oh, you know, would you, you know, if, if you need any analysis for the draft stuff and you know i'd be happy to help out and he was just kind of like oh i think we i think we have everything we need and so i was like oh okay well so i went kind of back and i um i ripped a bunch of data off of i scraped a bunch of web pages on um mostly around measurables so uh, that time i was looking at like combine data uh, and i just did some uh analysis of that stuff and then i gave it to him as sort of a report and he was like wow this is pretty interesting can you you know do more of this and so, um, yeah, each year we kind of grew a little more. At first it was just myself and Brian, the guy who does all the analysis for coach, where we would just kind of sit and brainstorm on ideas of uh, what we could look at and things like that. And then um, so we kind of created what we wanted and it grew and grew uh, until two years ago. They kind of said, like, why don't you just – have your own department and hire on someone else. So that's when we hired on a data engineer and, um, and Josh. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, it, it was kind of, it was kind of a both, you know, I don't think I really intended it to, to happen like that. Um, it was more just like sitting around with some data and curious and asking questions. And then, 
we just kept adding to things and the more we did it, I guess we just kind of pushed the ball a little bit downhill and until it snowballed into kind of creating what we wanted. Nice. I'm always interested in this question of sports science in the US and this is maybe because just my curiosity from being across here. But what's where does where does sports science sit? And maybe what's how's that changed over the last potentially five years because it's a nice round number and it's the last time we spoke. So is is how it where it sits changed? Has its perception changed? Well, I think if you look across the US, I mean I guess broadly across the world, maybe we could even say, um, in general, probably because of where sports science came from, if we look at the history, and, and I think that is important to do, whatever scientific field you're in, is to understand a little bit about the history, because it can help you with understanding why things are the way they are and, and where operational definitions came from and things like that. And if we look across the history, you know, sports science was originally um, very physiology driven, you know, started with endurance athletes and understanding, you know, modeling Olympic athletes and runners and things like that. And then, you know, kind of progressed into team sport where you had people just, you know, manually coding games like uh, Brian Dawson did a lot of old AFL research and Tom Riley and these people, you know, just kind of sitting in front of the TV and, you know, sprint one, sprint two, sprint, you know, little slash marks on a page and then summing them up at the end of a game and, and trying to do that for a few games to explore, you know, explore what they saw um, and then try and take that back to the lab and say, oh, if we saw this many sprints of this much distance, and we take these athletes and we put them on a treadmill physiologically, what happens to them, right? It was a, uh, I would say that's, it was a very basic science approach, right? It was very lab-based. It was everything that you think of when you think of science, like total academia, right? Like observe the natural world, bring it back to the lab, test some things, see how it works, you know, and explain and try and explain what happened. Um, as things progressed and technology started to give us ways of looking at players in the field, uh, it became a little bit more applied or what we would call like in industry-based science, where now we're actually in the environment and, and um, ecologically we're trying to understand what happens on the day-to-day -day and, and all of that kind of stuff. And so when you look across the world, I think sports science still has that. It's still very rooted in like, this is how we train and this is, you know, it's something for the strength staff or for the medical staff to understand return to play and things like that. Um, I think in what, what you see maybe across the pond in, in Europe, in the UK, in Australia, certainly as well, um, there's, there's a stronger commitment to sports science, which uh, in, in terms of organizationally. And I think in the US, it's still looked at like, ooh, we, th we think we need this. We think it's important. We don't really know how to operationalize it. So instead of trying to identify the qualities that a sports scientist should have, they try and identify the technology that they think is useful and then purchase that and give it to, you know, the third assistant strength coach to turn on and off every day and then print the stock graphs and reports that come from the, um, you know, from the website that the, that the company has set up. And that, that's not really... There's nothing scientific about it really right they're not really exploring that technology they're not really trying to figure out if that technology is even a worthwhile purchase they're not trying to understand that technology within the context of their sport so i think from that end um we're, we're probably still lagging behind in terms of our inability to really truly commit to putting people in place that, you know, understand the scientific process and, and, the, and can, you know, apply some sort of methodological rigor to, um, to explaining the sport at a more scientific level. So I think, I think we're still lacking in that. And, and so I guess that, that is, um, you know, that is probably unique, a little more unique to the U S and then I think when we look globally though, um, my it's, and I wrote a paper about this with two colleagues, Tom Kempton at Carleton FC in the AFL and Johan Wint at, and the MLS at Vancouver Whitecaps. And we wrote this, this paper about kind of almost like business intelligence and sports science. And, you know, again, if we look at historically, originally the original, you know, physiology guys were exploring the sport from a very physiological level and it's endurance sport. So that makes sense. I think when you get into team sport, 
you know, the role of sports science should be to understand the sport from multiple angles and multiple levels. So business intelligence uh, just says like, well, we can apply the same scientific rigor to exploring the economics of the game. We can explore, you know, decision making within the game. Um, we can explore how players progress throughout a career with metrics that are performance related on the field versus metrics that are only physiology related. And so I do think that, you know, when I think about when I myself think about sports science, one man's opinion here, I, I think that we, you know, in team sport specifically, we should have a more broader outlook um, because a lot of times the data that you're collecting can be used to explain other things if you just knew enough to ask the question. So is that where you started when you thought that you could have a potential impact on the bigger organization? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was, and that was what, you know, the initial questions that Brian and I were trying to answer were centered around that was like, well, we're collecting all this physiology type of data. We're collecting all this training load data. Um, is it actually changing the way guys do things on the field? Like, is it influencing performance? I, I think loosely, I mean, generally, I, I think that may be one of the reasons why in team sport, many sports science goes the realm of looking at injury because performance is really hard to quantify. You could have a, you could be really strong and really fast and really fit and have a great week of training and, and show up at the game and get punched in the teeth because, you know, the team just had a better game plan than you. It's not that they're any more fit or strong or fast or, or whatever. And, and so, um, you know, so I think most sports science is like, oh, that's really hard to figure out defining performance within the team. So let's kind of go ahead and, and look at injury. It's something, again, if we, tease it back to the history. It's something as like a, a, a physiology guy, like that makes sense. Like I can look at how people train and look at injury and it, it makes sense within my world. And so Brian and I would just sit down and say like, well, you know, is any of this stuff that we're collecting um, influencing the way that people play or uh, can it be used to explain different components of the game and things like that? So was it when you looked at that? So it's hard. I'm not going to lie. Um, Team sport is very contextual, especially, you know, American football where it's single discrete plays and those discrete plays are designed to go a certain way. They're designed to look a certain way. Players are designed to, you know, run from point A to point B and, and that's what they do. Um, and then you have the context of the defense trying to prevent you from running from point A to point B in a certain amount of time to make the pass or whatever. So that is a, it, it, is, it is a little tricky uh, in that regard. What I'm always trying to think about is isolating certain components of a play. Um, you know, because if we look at things like at a very global level, you could have a guy who runs a really fast 40 at the combine, but he's not a great receiver because maybe he doesn't catch the ball well. Or maybe he's really fast running downfield by himself, but once he gets hit at the line, he's unable to get off the line and, and get open again, right? So we're always trying to isolate certain components of a game or of a play or of a style of play within specific position groups because each position group is rather unique with regard to the ergonomic demands. But we try to look at those and say like, okay, if I could tease this out, you know, does, does this, you know, does this measure of speed that we test on the player say anything about their ability to you know close on the ball in in instances where they're that's their job right um and so and then and then that leads you know that's like a to b and then b to c is well can we intervene and change that right if i make you faster can you you know if i make you quicker if i make you stronger are you able to do that more efficiently um, and then can we show that it's actually working right that's the um, so it is, it is tough, um, and there, there are relationships there. Um, none of these relationships are large. Like, you're, you know, you're never going to find these smoking gun, like, wow, this is it. We've explained it all. Um, and that's just because the context is in, in the, there's lots of things that we, uh, you know, that we're uncertain about. Like, we just don't know. Like, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of naive to like, oh, how do we, how do we, judge reaction time and mentally like what they do and you know all these things that we probably 
we can't test, we don't test, uh, we don't have ways of testing, you know, um, but that's just like the nature of the beast with any scientific experiment is there's always things that we're going to uh, be able to capture. There's always some proxy measurements for things that we think are important, but we can't capture. And then there's things that, you know, we probably don't even know they're important yet because as humans, we're not smart enough. <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to go on to the, um, the, well, the development and the research and development part of your, your job title. But that, okay. that that mic's getting a little bit scratchy. Is it? I'm, I'm yeah, holding that's it. All right, that's all right. That's all right. That's okay. We'll let you off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the research and development. Yeah. So there's there's things we, we can't answer. There's things we want to. We've got, there's questions we've got that we want to answer because of what we've got to, at, at our disposal. We can't yes. potentially answer them. I'm guessing part of that role as as what you've got is looking potentially outside the field and sourcing information, technology, um, expertise that can potentially, is untapped because it's been, the, the, the question's been asked in a different environment, different industry, and you want to bring that back. Is that right? Yeah, no, that's totally, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time reading outside of this field, lots uh, outside of the physiology field, I guess where uh, you and I probably spent most of our training, you know, um, I probably, every year I read less and less of that stuff and, and more on things like, you know, uh, behavioral economics and finance and the stock market, um, biology, uh, you know, and ecology, quantitative biologists and ecologists, uh, I mean, environmental biologists, you know, they've done amazing stuff. And when you look at, you know, research that they do where they're trying to explore the way that vegetation grows in Lake Washington versus Lake Erie versus, you know, a lake in Minnesota versus, you know, Florida, um, it's, you, that's, they're trying to look at these effects in really noisy environments, in very different environments. And that's really not different than exploring relationships between players and coaches on different teams and behaviors of players on different teams. And, you know, it's much as, as much a social science as it is a sports science. You know, you're trying to, um, uh, there's a lot more going on than just the physiology or the biomechanics. Do you, do you think we get too way down in the specifics? and don't look wide enough. Were you potentially guilty of that? Like maybe in your younger age that it was it was all about, like you said, the physiology and the biomechanics where actually now you're broadening what you look at and where you, where you were influenced? You know, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that can certainly be a possibility. I think you have to recognize uh, maybe, you have to recognize the elements that people are um, are good at and the things that they want to do. And if you have someone who's a brilliant physiologist, um, you might not ask them to look across multiple things. You might be asking them to solve physiology problems. You know, I'm not good at anything, so I just look <laughs> at everything, right? So that's, you know, that's kind of my, my thing is if, if I'm not good at anything, I'll just try and know a little bit about everything. And and make it a challenge to learn as much, you know, as many different things as possible. Um, so, you, you know, you try and um, identify the things that people are, uh, are most suited for. You know, if you look at our club, like, like Josh, um, you know, he, he was a computer scientist, you know, he worked in, in finance and stock market stuff. Um, he's really good at looking at things from an economical perspective. Um, but, if it comes down to like a new technology that we want to understand the reliability and validity of, um, I'm probably more suited to try and answer that question. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't talk across different domains because of course we do and we read across different domains, but you know, there's people that are more suited to do certain things and, and that's the whole point of having a good team of staff. I mean, it's a research teams don't, you know, research teams work the same way. Not everybody's the data analyst. Some, some people are great at methodology. Other people are great at science communication and writing. Um, and other people just want to analyze the data because that's what they're good at. So uh, it's like anything, you know, you try and, um, uh, 
you try and work across um, multiple areas and find people that are good at certain elements of it mm -hmm. to broaden you out. I, I think that might be a problem. You know, certainly whenever I've visited the UK, if, if I visit a Premier League club, you know, the sports science staff is mostly made up of physiology people and strength, you know, strength coaches, fitness coaches. Um, and so I, I do, I do think there is a bit too much homogeneity there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and maybe that kind of limits their ability to, you know, I was talking with this, uh, um, sports economist over in the UK and he's done some consulting work with different clubs. And, you know, we were talking about, um, lots of different things. He's a quantitative uh, economist and we were talking about some projects we might want to do together, some research. And, and, um, he's like, oh yeah, you know, I, when I visit these clubs and I, and I try and, you know, delve into sports science, it's, you know, most of them aren't really thinking about these things. Um, and I think that's just probably because they're, they're thinking about their little, you know, their little box. And maybe again, because it's, they're really good at those things. And, you know, people want to stay within the realm that they're good at because it's, you know, it's comfortable and you know, you know, you don't get too much out of your space. And like I said, maybe the blessing is that I'm not good at anything. So I can just kind of <laughs> talk like an idiot across all, all, all these things. And, you know, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. Do you think you've had a, been able to have a bigger impact or you felt you've been able to have a bigger impact on the organization as a whole in this role rather than being in the, I suppose, the, just the traditional sports science position? Um, I think so because I think so for two reasons, I guess. Uh, one is you're able to touch more parts of the operation. Um, and even if the even if the folks aren't using what you produce 100%, even if they're not using it 50%, 20%, um, it is something that they're listening to and hearing. And in the process of doing that, you're sort of in some way, underlying way, you're nudging them in a direction. Um, and and the, the second way that I feel like the, the, the reach has been larger is that uh, maybe because I came from traditional sports science, um, I can push some of that stuff within the message to show them why it's important and why an organization might want to invest in such things um, and, and why, it, why it should be valued for return to play and, and identifying player qualities or, or um, you know, player deficiencies and, and, and things like that because it enhances what the strength staff can do when they have that information, it enhances what the medical staff can do once a player gets uh, injured, and then it can potentially help push information about why a certain player performs the way that he does. Cool. I did a little bit of stalking on your on your Twitter, and I was aware that you had a little thing going on on uh, is it YouTube that you do it your, your videos. No. Yeah, we do a, uh, myself and um, a friend of mine who's a data engineer at Fred, Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center uh, in downtown Seattle. Um, we, you know, we used to sit around at bars and talk shop and um, about data analysis and R. He's the leader of the uh, R meetup group here in, in Seattle. So uh, eventually we were like, oh, you know, there's this thing called Tidy Tuesday. Uh, which was put on by this uh, gentleman named Thomas Mock. And um, basically it was a way that every Tuesday he releases a new data set open to the public. And um, the idea is you hone your skills at, you know, at coding by uh, downloading this data set and just like working on it and sharing on Twitter. And then people kind of like, oh, that's cool, you know, help you out. And, and um, you know, you grow your ability to, to, do these things and you also get to put together projects which are good for when you go for job interviews and so we were like oh, i wonder how we could get more people to do this and so he put out a poll that just said you know what what's holding you back is it time is it you know scared of where to start and you know a lot of people were like i'm kind of scared of where to start i see what people produce and i don't think i could produce something as nice so we were like wow there's an opportunity here where we can create a screencast that um, takes, you know, we, we scour through, you know, from Tuesday to Friday and look for a code, you know, that someone has shared that, oh, this looks kind of nice. Let's talk through this for the people. And then we'll take some sports data 
and we'll um, we'll apply what they did to sports data and hopefully, you know, the sports science world grows from it, the exercise science, exercise physiology research world grows from it, and you know, people in the public grow from it. So yeah, so we do that every Sunday. Nice. My next question was on this front, on the on the stats side of things, and it's it's come up, it comes up all, <clears throat> excuse me, comes up all the time with R and Python and things that people are um, learning this, even if it's kind of just a just a project on the side for upskilling themselves and become aware yeah. of this kind of stuff. From your point of view, is there anything on that front that people, sports scientists in particular, even strength and conditioning coaches, should be starting to become aware of because of its prevalence in these kind of roles like you have where it is it is having an impact well i do i do think um you know kind of back to one of our earlier discussion points um you know find roles that you're most passionate about not not every sports scientist is necessarily going to do data analysis they might be great methodology people they might be great at communicating to the coaches or they might be even great at like just aggregating science and assisting with best practices so there's different roles that people can have but i, I do think having some basic knowledge some just some you know fundamental knowledge um is is really important you know knowing things about how to just put together like a simple reliability or validity type of study and test and just some basic analysis, I mean, you know, basic analysis around that kind of stuff. Um, you know, knowing some common pitfalls when you're looking at data so that you can be skeptical of technology companies that might come in, but also so you can be skeptical of yourself and be aware of these things. Um, I do think there's been some pretty good books uh, that have been written for the general public that I, I feel like every sports scientist would benefit from reading um, because they explain some of these kind of pitfalls and, and do so in a, in a really elegant and simple ways, probably far better than I could. Um, you know, one is probably that you've had a million people mention on your podcast, <clears throat> um, Nate Silver's Signal and Noise, mm -hmm. Signal and the Noise is a popular one. Uh, one that I just recently read was uh, actually, I think he teaches at Oxford over there in, in, in England um, is by a guy named David Spiegelhalter, and he's a uh, statistician who teaches at Oxford. And I think he does something with data communication with for the government or communic or uh, consulting or something like that. But he wrote this book called The Art of Statistics, and it's a, a very simple read for the general public to kind of help them gain knowledge in looking at data when it's presented to them in the media, in print, online, etc. Another one is that it's not out yet, actually, but it's a professor over here at UW, and it's by his name is Carl Bergstrom, and the book is called Calling Bullshit. I think and did you post that online? If you I did, I did post it. Yeah, and and if you YouTube it, you can get his whole class for free. I, I, they might have done it on Coursera, but it's on YouTube. You can get all all the lectures. Um, I think it's Jevin West and, and uh, Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West, I believe are the two authors and, and they teach the course. So the book's not out yet, but the course is great. And it's just about, again, like understanding simple stats when they're presented to you. Um, and I, I do think uh, there's a guy named Stephen Few who wrote a book called Signal. Um, it's like Signal, what, uh, what is it called? What, uh, Signal, what matters in the world, in a world of noise or the world of noise or something like that. Um, and Stephen Few is like a data visualization guy. And that book, um, I think is really useful if you're trying to explore um, ways of communicating your data through dashboards and things like that. It's just a great kind of read of really pretty pictures and stuff like that. And then, and I think, you know, if you can do those things, you can be effective. Um, the idea of using a coding language, uh, you know, if you're just trying to visualize things, simple click and point stuff like Power BI can be very powerful. Tableau is another one. Um, coding languages like R and Python are very useful uh, if you're going to be analyzing data, particularly in the sports environment where you might have multiple streams of data, you might have multiple years of data, you might have multiple, you know, lots of players. This is pretty messy um, data to deal with. It's very different than if you were working in academia where you do a controlled trial of 20 people and you have a column of 10 and a column of 10. Um, 
So having some skill set to code that stuff is useful for a few reasons. One, and I see it all the time with PhD students who send me this stuff is like, here's our, here's our Excel sheet. You know, I'd like to analyze this stuff for my PhD. And it's like a nightmare to look at because they've got pivot tables that connect to three pages, three tabs ago. And, and if you mess up one of those cells, like the whole thing breaks and unless you're the guy who built it, you know, the nice thing about coding languages is version control. Um, you can easily comment out everything. You know, all of my R scripts are detail commented out. Like, this is what I did here. This is why I did this. This is what I did here. This is why I removed that. This is why I solved this, blah, blah, blah. So if I'm not there, you know, if, if Josh is, is sitting at his desk and he's like, oh, you know, I need to, we need to build that into a web page, let's say. Can you send me the code? Um, I can send him my code. And even though he's, he's primarily a Python developer and I'm primarily an R developer, um, he can go through my code step by step and just literally read it and click enter and, and, and re, re, you know, redo my analysis um, because I detail it all out. You can't do that in Excel. Things are just everywhere and it's, it's a nightmare. So um, there, is, there is a benefit to that when you're dealing with data that's kind of, you know, cluttered and, and coming from all different areas and stuff like that. On one of them books, on the on the books that you mentioned, there was also one that I read along the similar lines to uh, the signal. Uh, so, R statistics about the common like the, the yeah, that's uh, David Spiegelhoff. Yes, book. there's one called Bad Science as well. Oh, I think it's uh, red. Yeah, do you know red, who wrote it? I don't. It's got a red orangey cover. That's the only uh, thing I, I remember. But it's, again, it's pretty cool. Cool it's book. a good one. Yeah. yeah. I, I think yeah. there's lots of books like that. I mean, yeah. you know, other books that just, I think when we talked about reading outside of your domain, things that like will help you think differently, you know, um, Freakonomics and super Freakonomics were great because you just see how, like how econo an economist might think. Um, super Forecasting is an amazing book. I thought that was incredible by Tetlock. Um, I just finished reading Richard Thaler's Misbehaving. Uh, misbehaving uh that he's an uh, um an, an a uh, uh economist behavioral economist and uh he's written lots of impressive studies on this kind of stuff so that you know that stuff really even though it's outside of the physiology realm it really makes you think about things in terms of like asking a question setting up a study within an environment you know behavioral economics is the study of how people make decisions with money you don't necessarily you can't you know do it a controlled study on that where you take some people and say make them poor and take some people and make them rich and see what happened and see how they behave once they get money 10 years later right so they have to ask these questions in in unique ways in order to try and um, tease that out or uncouple different relationships um, so i think reading things like that kahneman and tversky you know, thinking fast and slow, um, the undoing project, those are great books. And then I always try and take the next step of like, okay, I, you know, I just read Thaler's book. I'm going to try and read a whole bunch of his research. Um, you know, the book is written for the masses. It's written, but, and, and it tells great stories and it makes you think, but if I read the research, I want to, I want to explore like methodologically, how did he go about doing this? He just told me the story. He gave me the conclusion in a very, cute way and it was fun to read and, and you know nice but now I, I want to tease it back I want to see the methodology I want to see what papers he referenced to get to the thought process that he had because that's really going to inform my process going forward you know you set me up nicely there and I, I interjected with the, the bad science book but the data visualization principles mm -hmm. principles that you live by when it comes to data visualization so my um this is an interesting one. My number one principle is know what the audience wants. Okay. So I'd say, yeah. Go yeah, go on. No, go, go, go. I'd say when I started and, you know, everybody tells you like, oh, you got to be great at data visualization. Um, you need to be able to tell a story with data so people can see it. It's the only way people don't do well when they look at a table of numbers and like, yeah, you know, I totally get that. I mean, that's what our screencast every Sunday is all about. It's about data visualization. And I love that. Um, the, the problem is that if the person who's reading the report doesn't interact with charts and graphs well, 
you're going to have a really hard time communicating to them what's going on, no matter how simple the graph is. So there are some of our coaches that literally just say, give me the table of numbers with some conditional formatting. That the extent of their data visualization is a table with <laughs> colors. And that's what they, that's the easiest way for them to consume that information. Um, other coaches, you know, love like, you know, like our head coach loves, you know, like we got gadgety kind of app, web apps that I built that have, you know, passing maps and things. And, you know, you click on one thing and it shows this and, you know, he's, you know he thinks that's like the, coolest thing and he likes that so you have to really know your um, audience i mean we used to do stuff i remember one coach i want to say we would we went in like three straight weeks to give him this presentation and i you know i had all these viz pieces and we were talking through them and after week three he's just like hey, i gotta stop you and I'm like, okay he's gonna tell me he hates this and he says uh you know you're telling me there's blue and green and red dots on that chart and i'm like yeah he's like i'm colorblind like i can't so i've been going there for three weeks now you know doing this presentation he's like i can't see any of that like i look at graphs and not, i can't make sense of any of this because i always feel like i'm missing something because i can't see color so he interacts well with a table of data you know and that, that's it so yeah i mean and and you bold you bold the numbers right because you can't see the color so you, you have to or italicize it. you know you figure out how to show them a different way. So I think you really need to know your audience. Um, other than that, you know, I love visualization. Like maybe it's because I'm dumb. I, you know, I have to see it. Like I, I think it's cool to look at. Um, I, there's different ways you can take this. Um, you know, I've gone to the courses that Edward Tufte teaches and he's like a data visual and I have all his books and like, he's brilliant, but I look at that stuff and I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at. Like, it's very artistic, mm -hmm. and it's it's a, it's like a beautiful look at data. But if I have to make a decision, I can't glean the information I need from that. Maybe I'm just not smart enough. Like, I just look at it, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm looking at. I think Stephen Few does a great job of very like making just very simple graphs that say if it's time series data, visual it like you know, visual it, visualize it like this. These are the common pitfalls. You know, be aware of this and show that. And it's like, oh, that's cool, you know? And so I think sometimes the most simple plots can convey really, really rich information, but it's just structuring in them in a way that people can consume them. On that first piece of actually trying to understand what people want, how what what's, what's that first process look like for you? I mean, it could be just be a conversation. It could be trial and error, but what what's the, what's the process that you go down? Well, a new coach, for example. Yeah, you give it to them both ways and then see which one that they immediately start going to and asking you questions about. Some of them will start asking you questions about the graph. Oh, why, you know, why does the trend go up and what does this number mean or what does that mean? Some of them will go always to the table, uh, but really quickly you're going to find out what resonates with them. Um, so you always start with both. You know, football coaches, I mean, they they live inside I, soccer, I, I assume, are the same way. They live inside the video. Awesome. They, you know, so I mean, for part of our staff, like literally we just stopped putting any of our presentation material up. All we do is we sit down as a staff three days before our meeting with our coaches um, and we write down all the bullet points that we want. And then we go and we watch film ourselves and we identify the plays that tell the meaningful story of the data. So when we go to that meeting, we're just showing video in the background and we're like, okay, you know, we need you to, you know, this happens X amount of time because of this, here's what it looks like. And that really resonates with them because that's how they're going to go and consume it once we turn our backs. So I think you just start by kind of giving people the information and sort of seeing what they, um, what they naturally gravitate towards, you know? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Just moving back into into the sports science world, mm -hmm. and we had a little bit of a chat about my previous career at um, with a sports tech company. But I just wanted to get oh, yeah. your I just wanted to get your take on where we're at when it comes to train load monitoring tools. What what could where can what what questions companies are trying to answer 
and where they could actually improve with with what the pr practitioner i.e you actually want um i think that's an inch that's always an interesting one uh only from the standpoint that we have lots of technologies available in the in the uh uh, in that space. And I don't know that they're necessarily concerned with solving the practitioner's problems as much as they are with selling the technology. Okay. Right. I mean, okay. it's a business, you Gosh. know, it's a yeah, business. I and, yeah. and so, um, so I am kind of, uh, I'm sensitive to that. I get it. Um, I mean, I, I worked at Nike in the research lab. I kind of know that things have to sell in order for, investors to be happy and, and stuff like that. I mean, I guess I'll start answering that question by saying technology doesn't solve problems. Um, people solve problems. And I think that since the people are solving the problems um, as sports scientists dealing with sports science technology, I think we need to be really sharp on asking the question, are the technologies that we're using able to inform us about our processes or are they just creating more noise? And so you see this all the time, conferences, you'll see it on Twitter, people put up this, oh, here's my new dashboard and it's got all the bells and whistles. And I often look at that and I'm like, man, is this gonna help you make a better decision? Like, I don't know where to start with this. Wh which, which component of this has anything to do with decision-making? It's nice, it's showy, it's you know, a nice athlete management system, but I don't know that it's going to necessarily help people make a logical decision when it comes time to making that decision. So th that's what I always start with first is if I'm gonna take on a new technology, the first thing I wanna know is in our environment, can I reliably collect this data? And then does it actually provide me with the information that I think it's supposed to provide me with, right? Is it valid for, for doing what it says it does? Well, we actually do that in our setting um, just in-house. So I'll, I'll run my own um, reliability studies and validity studies. You know, usually if I'm going to explore a new technology, I'll take it on myself. So I'll put it on, go out for a run, um, pull out the data. Okay, what does it say? You know, what do I think it means? What can I potentially use this for? What if I ask these questions? If I get comfortable with it, then I might recruit some of the medical staff, the, the ATs and the strength staff, and we'll do a little bit of a pilot study and say like, okay, well, what if, you know, how reliable is this? And what, what does the information mean? And what does it mean for different body types and all of those kinds of things? Um, and then if we feel good about that, we can move to sort of trialing it with a, a subset of the population. So maybe it's some of the practice squad players, maybe it's guys that are towards end stage of rehab. Um, if we have a, a good feel then for what the data is, is providing us, we start to structure or think about a way to operationalize that with, you know, across a club. Um, and for, for us, our clubs are larger than, uh, you know, Premier League clubs and, and things like in AFL clubs. So it is a little bit more tricky. And so then maybe that's like a season, the next season. So maybe it took a season for us to get there. And then the next season, we're going to try and really take a step and roll this out. Um, that's kind of the process that we go through. And, and we do that because I want to make sure that the things that I collect are actually informing the process. I would rather collect three things that we know a lot about than 30 things that we only know a little bit about each one. And that, that's what I often see with the dashboards that people put online. It's like, you have, you showed me 20 things. And if 18 of them were in the green, because everything has to be a green, yellow, red traffic light for some reason, if 18 of them were in the green and two of them were in the red, what do you tell your coach? Uh, and oftentimes people will come back and, and they'll give you the, oh, well, it depends on which two, because if it's these two, we're really concerned. And if it's these two, we're not. And I'm like, well, so if you have four things up there that you're really concerned about, that would actually, would actually a flag in those, one of those four things would, would kind of push you to want to go tell the coach, let's remove 16 of them and try and really study those four things and be very good at understanding what that means. 
you know, the players have tons of touch points. They come in, they get, you know, they meet with the equipment staff, they go to nutrition, they get some food, they got, you know, they got to go to their locker, they got to meet with media, their coaches, practice. You know, the last thing we want is to add more touch points to that day because it just becomes obnoxious for them. So I'd rather be really um, clear on the key things that we want to um, that we want to collect, and also um, also be able to show that they mean something that allows us to make a better decision. Because um, otherwise, we're just creating noise. Uh, you you can do social experiments. We, we, you you know Dean, um, who, worked, who worked here for a bit. So you know. One, I, I did a social experiment with him once where he asked me to on him or with him. Well, on him. Okay. Uh, he asked me. Yeah, he asked me to build him this report that um, I didn't think was going to be particularly useful, uh, but I did it anyway, and so I added it to the the daily mix. So I build this report, and he's like, got it, and he you know looks at it and talks about it, and then slowly he stops talking about it. So I said, okay. I'm going to no longer do this report and see how long it takes him to realize that I'm no longer doing the report. Uh, and that'll really tell me a lot about whether I think the report is actually influencing decision making. So it took him about five days. Um, and then he was like, hey, you didn't do that report. And I said, yeah, I'm never doing it again. Because if, if it's not important that you're going to use it every day, it, we're just, we're not creating something that you know, not, not, and not, not to say that there aren't reports that are weekly or something like that, but this is something that was daily, you know? So it's like, we don't need to create more noise, right? We don't need to create a random number generator that just pops up numbers. Um, we want to, we want to identify things that tell us something meaningful and help inform the process. I just want to talk about that operationalizing the process of operationalizing that technology. What's that process look like of how it's actually, cause that, there's plenty of technology out there. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing that plenty would maybe tick that box of valid and reliable. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. But actually, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Maybe that's, that's false. Um, but actually getting it into the club so it becomes operational across the across the organization, how mm -hmm. do you ensure that can happen? I'm guessing that's a quite a difficult thing to, to go through. Um, it is difficult. I think so. You know, the first part that I kind of explained, like trying stuff on myself, maybe mm. rec recruiting a few of the staff that, you know, that can do a uh, be subjects in a reliability mm. study and, and that kind of stuff. You know, our scouts make fun of me because sometimes during training camp, they would look out on the field and I'd be running up and down it with a little, you know, sensors on and they're like, and the laptops open. So at every lap I stop and I, you know, record some notes and then I go and they're like, what are you doing? And yeah. I, it's all in the name of science. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, th that legwork is vital yeah. because it, it shows the staff. And so since we're talking about sports science technology, it shows the strength staff and the medical staff that this is important enough for us to delve into. If I can get to a point where I can show that it's reliable and I can provide some analysis that explains something that's going to be useful to them, that starts the process of operationalizing it because now I have buy-in. And, okay. and that's, where I, that's where I always try and start. You know, when I started, I went, when I started my first day at the club, I went to the medical staff, I went to the strength staff, and the first question I ask is, you know, after the pleasantries, the first question that I ask is, um, you know, if there's one or two or three things that you always felt like you wanted to know about the players, that if you had that information, it could maybe, you know, help you do your job more efficiently or make a better decision, you know, just jot those things down and let's think about them. And maybe we can find ways of collecting that information. I'll, I'll you know, figure out a way to get that. Um, so operationalizing something like this, it has to be something that isn't important to me. It's not like one of, you know, another one of Patrick's science projects. It has to be something that's important to the staff because ultimately they're going to have to be the ones that help collect it with the players. They're going to have to answer the questions that the players have. And so I have to make sure that whatever I'm using, I can turn it back and say, hey, I vetted this. I think it can be useful to do these things. 
and this these things are important because dot 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 and this is how i think we can maybe work it into the daily schedule and if i can show them that then i have them bought in like okay yeah i see why this is important how how can we help but it's but it has to be things that are important to them or you have to make you have to show it you know you have to show it out in a way that hey this is going to be important for you going forward because otherwise it's, it's you know it's cool for me it's just like a little science project but i'm not necessarily um helping mm -hmm. is there anything any any tech that's got past the kind of valid and reliable bit you running around your pitch or whatever it is but not been able to actually integrate in the daily schedule and or weekly schedule that's just hit that brick wall and was like it's great but it's just not going to work in our environment you know i i think there's things like um you know what well, we do we do nordboard tests and things like that i like the idea of um some sort of like isometric test every week that can kind of tell you something about uh, where the players are at uh, provided you can collect it in a reasonable way um, it's been hard to get something like that off the ground uh, one again we have a large club um, the teams are large here players coming in and out um, Two, uh, there's the you need a commitment to purchase enough equipment then because you have a large club to make it feasible. You know, if you have 63 guys and only two Nord boards, even if you're not doing the full eccentric test, but just having people lie prone and isometrically contract, um, you know, two Nord boards for 63 dudes is, you know, the cut. second you have players, you know, million dollar players waiting in line. It never is going to go well, no, no. Right, right? So um, I, I do, I see, I see that those things could be valuable. Um, I, I think they could be useful for us, but I haven't found a great way yet to get enough people on board to be like, okay, every Monday morning or every Wednesday morning, we're doing this. Um, and that's the other piece is like, even if you operationalize doing it, my other thing is, how are we going to use it, right? If it comes up in the red, what do you want to do? What yeah. do you tell coach? How do you, you know, because otherwise it's like, oh, that was cool. Well, <laughs> we got five guys in the red. What is, you know, the, the decision theory to me is the interesting piece. Is like, how are we going to use it? How does it work with all the other data that you collect? I mean, we don't collect much stuff. Again, back to the idea that we try and keep it simple. Um, we, we obviously have training load data for practice. Uh, so catapult, inertial sensors, accelerometer, gyroscope, those kinds of things, uh, GPS. We have those for practice. We have an RPE measure, um, which which is useful for most of the players. Uh, there have been the few that always give it a seven. Um, I, I bend the wellness questionnaires because every there's there wasn't variability in it, and it wasn't sensitive. Like it wasn't sensitive to the thing. If if you had a really hard session yesterday. There wasn't a, um, a high probability that you were going to come in and say that you felt like crap the next day. So either players tolerate hard sessions just fine, or they don't ever want to tell you that they feel bad. And there could be varying reasons as to why. So we bend that. It was noise. It wasn't helping us make any decisions that were logical. So that went away. Um, so the daily training information is the most useful because it tells us something about what the players did in terms of what was prescribed to them and the context of that session, you know, all the things that the coaches had planned. And then it tells us how they perceived it. And with those two bits of information, we can begin to go down the route of saying, hmm, did they perceive, did Rob perceive this session the way that I would expect Rob to perceive this session given the way that it was performed and given how I know Rob usually responds. And when you have really large residuals, when you have really large differences between what was expected and what Rob actually said, um, that's when the flag goes up. Oh, why did he say this was so hard? This is, this is weird. And five out of the last seven sessions, he's said that they were harder than he would, you know, we would normally expect. This is a behavior from Rob that is outside of what we would characterize as normal. And that's going to force us to now have a conversation about Rob amongst ourselves and what we can maybe ask him and do, which, which 
person on staff has the best relationship with Rob and, and maybe can go talk to him and find out how he's doing. Cause they're, you know, RPE isn't just a physiological thing. It's, it's, it's this, you know, both psychophysiological information. So there might be other things going on. It could be influenced by psycho, you know, psychological things. Maybe his wife had a baby or wrecked his car or whatever. Um, so we want to figure that stuff out. And then it, it can further force our hand then to go and have a conversation with our coach about, hey, we don't think this guy is tolerating practice well. Here's what it looks like. He's outside of what we would normally expect given you know, given the known behavior for him and the way that you've been running practice lately, we're concerned about this. We'd like to take some steps to try and um, control his practice demands a little bit more and get him to a better place. So, mm -hmm. do you have one RP for the day? Uh, one RP for the day. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. training. The uh, you mean like, do we have one for weight? Weightlifting. Correct. And, correct. Correct. Yeah. No. Just we just use the um, we just look at the practice one. Um, okay. Okay. We we used to do some weightlifting one. Um, I don't know that it was weight weightlifting is is you know RPE is interesting, right? RPE is a measure that was originally developed again, like understanding the history of where this stuff comes from. Right? The Borg scale was originally developed by looking at RPE. Um, relative to internal physiological markers, like okay, we would you know we put people on a bike and we have them pedal really hard, and then we take their lactate and we look at their heart rate and maybe some um, expired gases and things like that, and we try and figure out you know at what level does the RP begin to that's why right right and then then the CR10 scale, which which Foster created in or at least published, maybe he created it earlier, but published in ninety nine and two thousand one, those were the two kind of seminal papers on, on the work initially, um, that was to get it onto this 10 point scale and something that was manageable. I think, I think in two, in the 1999 paper, he phrased it with the sentence. Um, we want, we ask the athletes, how hard was training on a, you know, on this scale as if you were explaining it to your mom or something, it was like something so, sim you know, simplistic, um, because, you know, we're dealing with, especially, well, not so much us, our, our, players are more homogenous. I mean, Premier League, you might have guys who speak Spanish, French, right? You know, they interpret things way different, right? They might not even understand what they're answering. So he made that scale. And, but it was, again, it was very physiology based. That's why if you look at that scale, the, the CR10 scale, the, a five is a moderate, or, or sorry, a five is a hard session. And then it scales up, you know, so it's like one, two, three, four, five is hard. And then seven is very hard. And then 10 is maximum. You know, if, if, if you show people a, a set of 10 numbers, five intuitively is moderate middle, it's easy middle. yeah middle but that didn't relate to the physiology when you know um so when you look at weight training even when you look at the rpe for us um because it's such an intermittent sport with such a diverse demand of collisions and locomotor activity and change of direction um we might have to, i don't know that the rpe in in the traditional sense of the way that it's been applied is the right approach for the weight room or for American football. Uh, we might have to reframe it because the demands are not cyclical endurance-based demands. Um, so there was a whole chapter in my PhD uh, thesis on on RPE and, and um, how we use it. And we actually use a normal 10-point scale rather than the CR10 scale um, because our players interacted with that much better. And, um, you know, you can see things like, oh, when they have full pads on, they perceive the session to be harder. Well, that session also has more hitting and more collisions when they have higher IMA loads and player loads, there's a higher RPE. Um, that is uncoupled from any sort of like cyclical running demand because it's so intermittent. So um, there might be, you know, maybe RPE isn't even the right term to use for it in our setting or in the weight room. We might have to reframe that um, in order to better understand what it is we're collecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's sports science. How long did your wellness questionnaires last? Um, let's see, probably three seasons. I mean, three or four seasons. People really wanted to make a push. And yeah, okay. I was skeptical, but we, we did it. Um, RPE is an, 
easier-ish one, I think, to anchor people to. You know, when you use the language like, hey, a 10 is the hardest ever college practice you've ever had. All of these kids in their mind can remember, you know, some hard-ass coach in the middle of summer in Alabama or Mississippi or down Texas, you know, somewhere in the South, just absolutely railing them. So they, they, they're like, oh, yeah, that was a bad day. And, and w wellness has always been a bit iffy to me. Um, you know, it's like you have this 10 point scale and, or seven point scale. And it's like, oh, uh, sometimes there's not even questions. It's like stress, sleep, soreness, mood. I don't even know. Like, if you ask me, like, Hey, how's your, uh, uh, you know, how's your, uh, uh energy today? I'd be like, I don't, what am I really answering? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, that's such, I mean, it's such a vague term. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know that it's. Um, I guess to your point about like stretching out across multiple domains, there's an entire set domain in psychology that's set up to figure out how people build scales and answer questions and, you know, within the population. Um, I think probably sports science hasn't done a great job of leveraging that relationship. We kind of like put numbers on a page and write the word stress over top and roll it out and, and hope that the players know what we're talking about. Um, so we gave it about four years really quickly. We removed some of the, we had stress, sleep, soreness, and energy, um, really quickly stress and, uh, and energy went away after like two years. Cause I was like, this doesn't, even if the players know what they're answering, they're always giving, there's no variability. It's, you know, it's always a seven, right? So this is, they're not interacting with this question. So let's get rid of it. It's creating noise. So soreness, and if I had to go back, I'd probably just create like a soreness scale and say, how, you know, how does your body feel today and scale it. Um, there's a, there's a, I think it's called a, uh, pr, pr, uh, what is it called? The PRS questionnaire, pr, readiness, um, something. It, it, it looks exactly like the RPE scale though. It was in JSCR and they, there's maybe three papers on it. I'd probably use something similar to that um that's just a single question about how sore you are and then maybe like a little figure of a guy and say like i touch my calves mm -hmm. if i was going to do it that that'd probably be the way to do it awesome we've tipped yeah. over the hour so i'm gonna let you get back on your work so middle of the afternoon but huh. but thanks before we go i don't want to get in the sack and blame me um before i let you go where's the best people for best place for people to get in touch with you should they have any questions should they want to discuss yeah. anything where's the best place you can, um, uh, twitter yep. uh, at osp patrick um you can always uh, follow there and, and send me messages there send me an email pward2 at gmail.com actually from my my blog will email you straight there so optimum sports uh you can find all of our screencasts and some of my blogs on um, you know, tips and tricks for data analysis and cleaning data and things like that. It's all there. And there's a little uh, contact me thing. And that'll just go right to my email too. So you do that. Awesome. Yeah. Patrick, thank you very much. Five years on for giving me time once again to have a chat. And, yeah. Thanks uh, for having me. My Two, pleasure. Second time. Yeah. My pleasure. Have a good day. Thank you again. And we'll chat thanks. soon. Bye. Cheers, Patrick.